Hi there, I'm Speed at the bottom of the helix. Our next presenter was hit with a curse, where every time he had a track plan for a layout developed, he moved, so nothing got built. Ever since then, Bruce enjoys operating on a number of friends' layouts and just hang out with them to build kits or do something. An NMRA Life member and now very active in the achievement program, only needs three more certificates to get MMR behind his name. For the past several years, he has been a part of the Modeler's Life podcast, where he is affectionately known as the moderately agitated mailboy. We welcome Mr. Bruce Wilson. Thanks, Pete. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, uh, I'm glad uh, you, you invited me to uh, enjoy, this, uh, or enjoy this event. It's been a remarkable uh, uh, bit so far. So uh, it's... Uh, uh, I hope I don't bore too many people, but we'll we'll see what happens. Uh, just a bit uh, about me, uh, why I'm presenting on the Cum Valley Light Railway, which I'll be talking about, is that uh, back in about 2003, I was involved in the NMRA convention in Toronto. And I was getting kind of burned out after that and losing interest in the hobby. So I was thinking maybe looking at uh, P87 and had some ideas and then I was in the local bookstore and found uh, the August 2003 issue of Railway Modeler from Britain, and it had a bunch of small British layouts in it. And I've been interested in British layouts on and off ever since I was a kid. So that's interesting. So I started looking some more. My friend, uh, the late Brian Phil, he had some uh, exhibition British layouts. He, uh, I helped him operate in seven millimeter. So I figured I might as well make a change and go to seven millimeter and then uh, somewhere along the way, doing some research, found a knee and rice track plan that referenced the Combe Valley Railway, and the rest is history. And I shall now tell you about the Combe Valley Light Railway. So anyhow, the Cum Valley Light Railway, it's a great western uh, branch line. And I'm just going to walk through a bit of the history of it and uh, why I think it's a good thing to model. So today's presentation, uh, what was the CVLR? Where was it located? Uh, a bit of the history of it. Uh, we'll take a trip up the line. Uh, why do I think this is a good railroad to model, railway to model? Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the layout design element concept. Uh, and then we'll talk about Hemyok, which is the terminus of the railway. And we'll talk a little bit about scale seven, which is uh, modeling in seven millimeter scale. So what was the Cum Valley Railway? It was built from Timberton Junction to Hemyok. Uh, total length is seven miles, 27 chains. The chain is 66 feet, so not very long. It followed the River Come Valley up uh, from Tiverton Junction. Uh, served uh, three principal towns, Ulfcum, Comstock, and Hemyock. And it was in operation for just under 100 years. Uh, light railway. What was the light railway? Why, what is the light railway concept? Uh, by 1850 in Britain, most of the National Railway Network was laid down. And then some towns realized, hey, railways look like a pretty good thing. We should probably try to get on a railway if we can. Uh, but a lot of these places wouldn't generate sufficient traffic to justify the expense of a railway. So the concept was put forward that if traffic wouldn't uh, support uh, a full-blown infrastructure railway, uh, you can maybe get away with something uh, lighter. or less, uh, So built to a lesser standard and operate accordingly. So a light railway, so railway light type thing. Uh, an act of 1864 permitted the railway to be built without a need for an individual act of parliament. Other railways had to have an act of parliament. So this was something that facilitated the construction of light railways. Uh, regulation 1868 permitted light railways in three of its clauses. Uh, the Board of Trade could decide uh, to authorize a railway subject to what conditions uh, they might like. So they quite often work with uh, the people proposing a railway to make it uh, work. Uh, maximum weight of eight tons per axle. So we're not having any heavy trains operating on this track. 
and then maximum speed of 25 miles an hour. So it's definitely not high speed. Okay, where was Cum Valley Light Railway located? Well, we're in the western part of England in, in Devonshire uh, within this red circle. And Tiverton Junction is where the railway started. And it basically followed the river Cum up the Cum Valley to Hemiac Station at the end, seven, uh, about seven and a half miles away. Chronology, 1884, the Bristol and Exeter Railway opened through Tiverton Junction to Exeter. And this would have been a broad gauge railway at the time, not the standard gauge. Uh, in June 12th, the branch from Tiverton opened uh, uh, to Tiverton Junction. And again, this is broad gauge. Uh, the Regulation of Railways Act in 1868 kind of helped form things for the light railway. Uh, 1872, first meeting to propose the railway. Uh, 1873, May 15th, the Cum Valley Light Railway Act. So the railway had its uh, birth basically then. 1876, third rail laid on the main line through to Exeter. And that would be third rail being standard gauge. So basically we had uh, multi-gauge track, broad gauge and standard gauge. Uh, in 1876, the Cum Valley Light Railway opened for traffic. Uh, June 1st, the formal opening of the Cum Valley Light Railway. Uh, 1877, Coldwater and Cum Davy sidings were approved and open, and this would be sources of traffic uh, for the railroad. 1880, uh, the Cum Valley Light Railway sold to the Great Western Railway. So at that point, it became a Great Western branch line. Great Western Railway wasn't real thrilled about it because they had to throw a bunch of money into to uh, fix it up to bring it up to somewhat of a standard they approved. Uh, 1886, the Cum Valley Dairy Company was founded in Hemiac, and this is the, went on to become the major industry on the railroad. So that was an important date as far as the railway was concerned. Uh, 1916, United Dairies, big name in the UK, took over the Cum Valley Dairy Company. Uh, private siding at Elfcom in 1919, and we'll talk about this later. And a 1920 private side agreement with United Dairy. So now the operations of the railway were, were set in place. Uh, Coldwater Halt open. This uh, we'll talk about later when we take the tour up the line. 1933, Whitehall Halt was another halt up the line open. Uh, this would be a passenger uh, place. Uh, 1963, September 7th, all passenger service were halted. So uh, this is the end of the beginning of the end. Uh, uh, Coldwater and Comstock and White's Tot were closed for all purposes. No more goods, passenger, or any of that type of traffic. Uh, September 65, Hemiac closed for all purposes. So no more traffic or uh, goods in except for the, uh, the traffic uh, in and out of the milk plant. 1967, Ulfcom closed for everything uh, railway related except for the, the private siding traffic. 1975, October 31, the, the dark day in the history of the railway, uh, the milk fa factory closed, last train from Hemiac and seven months short of 100 years. And in 1977, January, all the track lifted on, uh, was lifted from the line. Parts of the line are still preserved as uh, uh, hiking trails uh, in the area. Let's just take a quick journey up the line. We start at Tiverton Junction, uh, which is on the main line. We we'll go to Coldwater or Cold Harbor Halt, uh, the first stop, then the town of Ufcom, and we have the town of Comstock, Whitehall Halt, uh, Com David Brickworks for part of the history, and then the terminus uh, in Hemiac. So Tiverton Junction, uh, it's junction with the Great Western Exeter to Bristol line. All traffic to and from the CVLR went through Tiverton Junction. There was anything in or out, this is where it came from. Uh, branch line to Tiverton also connected there. So people journeying, they could get on the main line or go into Tiverton. Uh, here's a brief uh, map of Tiverton Junction. Uh, uh, passenger bridge over the tracks. Uh, station here, this line here is our line up to Hemiac. So this is the Cone Valley Railway at the start. 
Uh, this line curving around here is the Hemiok uh, branch line heading out uh, from the main line. There's the junction, the passenger overpass. Uh, this is a typical train arriving from Hemiok, uh, the 14XX uh, steam locomotive, several milk tanks, and a passenger car. So generally, uh, th this is the, what would operating on the CBLR. Uh, and here's a train uh, departing for Hemiok, 14XX locomotive, a passenger coach, not sure uh, what's behind it. There could be some milk tanks going up or other goods cars going up. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have that in this picture. Uh, now we're heading up the branch. This is the main line in the background. So we're curving away. And this is the starting to the steepest grade on the railway. And it's a tight curve. We'll talk about uh, this a bit later. And a fairly pastoral setting, cows, you know, the usual beautiful countryside setting. Uh, crossways cutting is, uh, again, here's the main line in the back. So we're coming through a cutting up the hill. They're replacing a, an old wooden footbridge that got rotted out at the time of the new concrete one, date unknown. Uh, but this sign here is of interest. It, it, it was a sign that informed all trains heading down into Tiverton Junction. They had to stop to make sure the train was under control and that uh, uh, everything was in order before they proceeded. Okay, our first stop up the line is Coldwater Halt. Uh, there's a big woolen mill here. This is the siding for the halt, main line heading up to Hemiok uh, from uh, left to right. Uh, this is 1903. The, the, the halt opened February 29, and it was in this area here. Uh, so it was basically a siding to serve the wool mill. It uh, held about nine cars, uh, two miles, 14 chains from Tiverton, nine wagons capacity. Uh, it was mainly coal for the mill. So they were providing the coal to power the uh, the woolen mill. Uh, passenger halt, February 29th. So that was servicing uh, employees of the mill uh, and uh, letting them get to and from uh, in a easy fashion. Uh, the mill is still around today. It's an operating historical site. And it's uh, they, they still weave the, the wools. And uh, it's quite interesting on TV a few times. Here, here's the halt, nothing fancy. We have a, a timber platform, a, a somewhat rudimentary uh, passenger shelter to protect from rain. Uh, important enough, did have gas lighting on the platforms. Uh, gate uh, keepers uh, uh, shack in the background. And this is also the ticket office for anybody who wanted to purchase tickets to ride the railroad. Uh, looking the other way, this is a train coming from Tiverton. This is the Willow Mill in the background. And we can see the siding here. And again, our building structure and the gatekeeper's house. Uh, the backside. Uh, so and anybody who thinks every sign is pretty neat and has to be neat, here's your proof that you can uh, do something that's not going to be so uh, fancy. But if you're modeling this, you want to make sure you capture the, the rustic look of that. And this awning is where the window was for purchasing tickets. And this is just a gate through into behind. Next town up the line be Elfcom. This is the major town on the line. Uh, track layout, it's, it's fairly simple. This was uh, uh, an earlier plan uh, before some of the sidings were in here. We'll take a look at that in just a minute. Uh, so when 1888, when it first opened, we had a good shed, which was a uh, pass through good shed. So uh, vans and wagons could enter into the good shed and be unloaded. Uh, loading dock, cattle dock, uh, and the platform with a station on it. Uh, later 30s, here's the private siding that uh, uh, we saw before, one of the major sources of traffic uh, on the line. And the traffic, the track layout slightly changed. The good shed's gone got an iron good shit on the platform, but not a real lot different. So a fairly simple, compact layout. Uh, it was the major intermediate station on the CVLR. Uh, it's a meat processing plant on that uh, siding uh, before they had a fire in the 1920s. And it was mainly cattle and sheep uh, uh, in and out. Uh, so livestock would come in, uh, be processed, and then uh, 
shipped back out. Uh, there was also a grain mill on the site later after the fire, uh, uh, which became a, the major a major industry on the on the, on the railway. Uh, there's also a brewery in town, uh, corn mills in town, and uh, a lot of uh, coal in for the mills and public use, uh, amongst other goods uh, traffic, agricultural shipments uh, uh, out uh, were main things. The railway facilities, not, not a lot, fairly simple. There was a station, which was a standard designed by a fellow named Arthur Payne, who designed a number of uh, stations, all of them at a similar dime for several different light railways. And we'll see this design peated up the line. Had an irons good lockup on the platform, replaced that earlier woods uh, good shed. Uh, had a loading dock, cattle dock, and a three-ton crane. So everything, that, that, was, that was the extent of railway facilities. Uh, quick look at what was uh, in and out for a number of years. So uh, passenger traffic, fairly steady, parcels, coal and coke. So here's an idea of what uh, the railway was hauling, which you can use for figuring out what trains you want to run a model later. Uh, it's an aerial view of uh, Ulfcom. This is the station down here, uh, the station building, the lockup. This is the grain mill, which was built on the site uh, of the meat processing plant. The brewery is back up here. And they're, you know, just a generally small town. And this is the River Culm uh, running through the foreground. Uh, the train approaching uh, Ulfcom, uh, 1938. So somewhat older uh, passenger stock and nothing fancy, but a typical train and the uh, cattle were predominant in the area. Uh, if you're looking back down towards uh, Tiverton Junction, here's our private siding for uh, the meat packing plant at the time. So we had here insulated vans for taking out uh, processed meat, that type of thing. Uh, a later view, uh, this is now the, uh, the grain plant. Uh, we have our three ton crane and this gas station back here appeared in pretty much every photo of the railway uh, in Ulfcom over the years, uh, cattle dock in behind the crane. Uh, typical train coming up from uh, uh, Tiverton Junction, uh, 14XX and a, a coach. And there's our standard brick uh, station. Uh, this wooden decoration was actually that, it was just wood decoration. Uh, it was served no structural purpose. Uh, here's a view looking station, looking up the line and we see this end of the station that would decorative features all off. But we can see it even in 1963, even though we're getting on in years, the station master still had some pride in the garden at the station and maintained it. Uh, here's a train coming down from Ulfcom in 1962. Typical train, we had a passenger coach, a couple of covered hoppers. There's an open goods van, a closed goods van and a... Uh, a, a brake van and just another train coming out, just a passenger train. So over the years, this scene was repeated countless times and not a lot changed in the foreground, a bunch of sacks of coal. Uh, later years, got some diesels on the line. So this, I think this is, I found this station or this picture online. I think it's just a wonderful uh, picture, very evocative, uh, you know, the life of the railway near the end. Uh, it just, it just speaks to me. I really, Really like this picture. Okay, next town up the line, we got Comstock. Again, we see our typical Arthur Payne station and track layout. Looks very similar to what we saw at uh, Ulfcom. Uh, I guess they thought if it worked there, it should work everywhere. So again, a very similar layout to what we saw. And originally the pass through good shed, uh, later changed the good shed removed on a dock, but basically the same loading dock, cattle dock, uh, crane. It's, Pretty much the same what we saw at Ulfcom. Uh, what we have for railway there, we had Arthur Payne Standard Station again. We had an iron goods lockup again. Uh, had a loading dock, a cattle dock, and our ever popular three ton crane. And again, another information on what was shipped on the line, which you can use for getting an idea of modeling. Not as much as what went on Comstock, but still enough that. Uh, uh, the railway made some money off it. So here's a typical train coming in. Uh, looks almost like Ulfcom, uh, except for the buildings in the background. So we've got their 
14 XX in the pasture coach, uh, uh, standard little boys to do what little boys like to do, watch trains. Uh, just a view up the main street into town. This is a, a pub and a hotel right by the, uh, the station. But again, this is a, a very modelable scene. Uh, again, this station, it's lost its wooden uh, facade uh, decorative. This is near the end of the line, so things are not in all that great shape. You see the garden is kind of gone, and it's, uh, uh, it's about over. Uh, this is what the uh, looked like originally. There's our in the middle of the pass through goods shed where vans and uh, wagons could go in and be unloaded. And we have to have a cattle wagon in at the cattle dock. Uh, there she is, about ready to be done. At this, at this point, it would have been abandoned. So uh, that's a, a sad time on the railway. Again, this one looks a little earlier because we see the station door open. So probably. Uh, a couple of years before their last shot. Uh, a fellow named Peter Gray, he took a lot of nice color photos of the line and I've managed to find a few of them online to use. But this is a train coming back from Hemiak with the uh, the coach and the uh, 14XX locomotive. Uh, interesting story of these coaches. These were the last ones used. They replaced some worn out ones. And originally they had uh, generators and electric lighting in them. But because of the slow speeds on the line, the train didn't go fast enough for the generators to work properly. So they had to take out the electrical lighting and put in gas lighting so there was lighting in the coaches. So slow speed operation, light railway, that's uh, what you get. Uh, Whitehall Halt, further up the line. Uh, I can't really find out why this was here, but it was. It had a uh, uh, the platform for passengers to get on a three uh, car siding. Uh, there was a cornmeal somewhere in this area, a corn mill somewhere in this area, I think uh, may have had something to do with it, but it, it, the sources I have aren't clear on it. Uh, here we have a train coming back from Hemiak with a bunch of milk tankers and pasture coach. Uh, this is our waiting shed. Uh, this would be the fireman opening the gates, uh, crossing keeper's house uh, there. Uh, again, uh, you might call this somewhat rustic uh, uh, and be kind to it. Uh, the signboard, the, the lettering's a little bit neater on this one, but there's no information. So I assume uh, if you were local, you knew when the train was coming, you could be there on time. And if you didn't, you could probably uh, walk to the next town without much problem. Uh, looking back towards the crossing keepers, hut and the, the halt, and this is our three car siding going off here. And again, look back, we're now on a bridge over the, the river Calm again. Uh, in later years, here's a, another one of the gas mechanicals uh, working the line. Calm David Brickworks, I mentioned this opened uh, from the, when the railroad opened 1886. Combe Davy Brickworks, they uh, surprisingly made bricks of all things. Uh, they, they, made, they were quite successful, but they were hoping for a big uh, contract to supply bricks for the building of the Severn River Tunnel, but they lost that contract. And shortly after that, the operation closed. Um, there's nothing visible you can see of this site anymore. We've looked at air photos, historic air photos, and even the material references uh, by the time the 20s were around, the, there was nothing left here to indicate the brickworks is there. But in this day, it would have loads, uh, loads of bricks coming out uh, to uh, be taken away. Okay, we've come to the end of the line here now at Hemiok. Uh, it went, as other towns went through uh, several variations in track plan. Uh, originally, uh, overnight engines and carriages were uh, stored on on site uh, so that the uh, a passenger train would be ready to go first thing in the morning. Uh, had a refreshment room uh, just outside of the railway property. And then later years, the layout changed a bit. As you can see, the, these signings are gone. We have a good shed in here. The water tower was relocated. Uh, the station buildings here and then uh, the, the cattle dock and then sidings into the, the milk factory.
So what we have for the railways, you can probably guess. We had the standard Arthur Payne station. We had an iron goods lockup on a platform, which replaced the earlier woods shed. Uh, we had a loading dock. We had a cattle dock. And yes, we also had the three-ton crane. Uh, the major industry on the railway was the milk plant. Uh, here's uh, an indication of the, the traffic. We can see it handled a fair number of parcels in and out, uh, long pastures. So it... Uh, it was certainly uh, one of the main reasons the uh, the town, uh, the railway was there. Uh, grand opening, uh, strictly a gentleman's affair from what I can see. I look and can't see any women in there, but this is it, June 1st, 1876. Uh, the first train in with uh, an open cab uh, locomotive uh, and a couple of old coaches. But uh, these chaps all are quite chuffed about the fact the railway has finally come to town. Uh, a shot looking uh, to the east. Uh, here's our good shed here, water tank uh, station. This is that refreshment house. We have the crane here. And this in the background is the, the milk factory. So there's two sidings uh, in there. Uh, we have a picture here of the uh, a train. He's shunting, uh, he's been shunting uh, loads out of the, uh, the milk factory, uh, the coaches are in behind out of the way while uh, he carries out his shunting work. Uh, if you looking from the west end, uh, I see milk tanks, a lot of milk tanks here and a general layout. So, and there's a view looking back towards Tiverton Junction. This is our station, again, the Arthur Payne design. Uh, it had a, a single box on this end, which controlled all the points, uh, uh, point locks, uh, uh, catch points, things like that. Uh, tucked in behind it was the the gentleman's uh, facilities. And totally out of keeping with everything else was this somewhat ugly concrete block, cinder block addition put on the station to give more space. So it's uh, totally aligned. But again, we see the standard decorative wood and that type of thing. Uh, this would be uh, a, 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 a wagon unloading coal given by the bags here. So they probably unloading coal ready to take for distribution. Uh, the, the goods dock and good uh, freight house and our three ton crane. Again, the station in the back and just the thing. But you can see relatively straightforward, simple uh, uh, track layout of one thing. This short little stretch in the, the, the goods loop here was some flat bottom rail. And you can really see that stand out in pictures when you look at it. And when you're modeling that, you want to make sure that you have your bullhead rail and then you have your stretch of flat uh, bottom rail just to make sure you have it right. Uh, view looking towards the one siding into the, the milk factory. Uh, I think this may be a, uh, a cattle wagon in that the dock. I'm not sure. It's hard to tell from that view and the single box on the end of the layout. Uh, here's a train arriving. Uh, first thing I'll do, they'll let the passengers get out. And then uh, uh, the uh, this is a earlier photo. We can see the old carriage sheds and uh, engine house in the background. Uh, the other thing is, this is one of the few pictures we see these wonderful enamel signs that were all over the uh, railways in Britain. And if you get some of the you start looking on the internet, you'll find some beautiful, beautiful uh, uh, signs out there that are were very common. Uh, train is now pulling out some wagons uh, uh, from the uh, the milk factory, the milk wagon. These look like covered hoppers here, and then we see the passenger coach sitting out of the way while he does work. And then later here, the diesel mechanical uh, was running into town. Uh, Early 50s, he was just looking at the station. So not a lot there is uh, compact and straightforward. No frills, no fuss. Uh, backside of the station. Again, we can see some of the timbering is coming off. And this is this totally out of keeping uh, cheap structure in the, the backside of the gentleman's facilities. Last passenger train, 63. So this is probably the most uh, number of passengers that were uh, on the line in a long, long time. So it's uh, 
thing and see uh health and safety uh yeah it's just wander around it's probably not a big deal because everybody knew where the engine was and what was going on so we're concerned there's the milk plant in the background later years we got this uh, uh six wheel uh diesel mechanical loco running the trains uh this is a special a rail fan special uh they chartered a couple uh, brake vans to ride up and down with one of the last trains on the line uh there's the train being put together getting ready to depart for Tiverton junction okay why would i want a model or why would anybody want a model well it's a small but interesting branch line we saw you know it's a lot of various features we like uh, scenic possibilities you can you, there's a lot there you can scenic not a lot of equipment required there was only ever one locomotive allowed on the line to use a staff system. So that's all you need. You need one locomotive and uh, some uh, sort of rolling stock. Uh, so we can run passenger only, goods only, and mixed uh, trains. Uh, you can faithfully model the towns and the operations. And not a lot of change from 1930s through to the end. Sharp radius curves, uh, six change, 396 feet. That's a very tight radius. Uh, we had a steep grade coming up out of uh, Tiverton Junction. After that, it was kind of a rolling up and down line. Uh, slow speeds, maximum about 15 miles per hour. I mentioned that was the problem with the electric lighting on the coach. Uh, short trains, there are you know, six, seven milk tanks and maybe a, a passenger coach, and that was it. Uh, and I think it's just ideal for a model railway. Uh, here's one of these tight curves. Uh, quite often, and we have a, a check rail on the inside of the curve to keep the uh, the equipment on, on the rails. And again, this is, we've seen this picture before, but again, here we've got a check rail on a tight radius curve so that uh, things don't come as drift. Equipment required. Well, we're gonna need uh, one of the 14XX Panny tank engines. Uh, we'll need a towed brake van, uh, uh, six wheel milk tank wagons, uh, need several of those uh, assortment of open and closed vans, uh, a couple passenger coaches, and then later years of type three and type 25 diesels. So here's a drawing of the typical uh, 14XX042 uh, locomotive that applied the line, uh, coal in the bunker, uh, water in the tanks at the side, uh, nice little locomotive. And this is the seven millimeter scale uh, modern outline kits. Uh, uh, version of it. I have this kit and I keep opening it and looking at it. It's a beautiful piece of work with uh, etched brass and etched nickel silver and some resin castings. And one of these days, uh, I'll get up the nerve to uh, put it together. Uh, class three shunter. These are the diesel mechanical shunters that had side rods on it. So uh, if you want to model later years, you can do that. Here we are at Hemiak, uh, milk tanks ready to leave. Uh, and again, it's seven millimeter, we can get it ready to run or in kit form. Uh, during the latter part of the operation, uh, class 25s also ran the line. So if you like class 25s, you can run a class 25 and there's a ready to run model of that available as well for those who wanna go with that. Uh, standard uh, six wheel milk uh, wagon. Uh, the ones on the Hemioc line were plain, no, uh, lettering on them. So there's plain Jane with the milk stains on them. Open, uh, open four wheel van, uh, closed vans and cattle wagons, uh, brake vans. Uh, there were some of these six wheel passenger coach and then later bogey coaches. Uh, another type of uh, brake van that was seen on the line on occasions, a bit longer porch on it. Layout design elements. Let's talk a bit about that. Uh, the initial uh, issue of layout, uh, model railroad planning, Tony Custer uh, introduced the concept of the uh, layout design element or LDE. A simple premise, find a modable hunk of full-size railroad, document it physically and operationally, and then scale it down to fit a reasonable space. And the hunk could be anything, yard, engine, terminal, industry, town, or important scene. Uh, we'll talk about this and we'll see why. Each town on the Combe Valley is an ideal candidate for an LDE. They're relatively small. You can model the track layout exactly in smaller scales. 
Uh, and if you have space, you can do individual LDEs and then link them together with a track between such as uh, Ian Rice has done on some of his where the town's basically become a standalone scene linked by unseen at track uh, between them. So the first one, uh, Alfcom, is, uh, again, we've seen this very simple track layout. Uh, whether you go early or late, it's you don't need a lot to be able to model that in uh, uh, four millimeter scale, double O scale, or scale seven. Uh, Comstock, same thing. We've got a simple track layout. Not a lot of railway infrastructure to model. Uh, track load again, simple. So we can also model that uh, fairly faithfully. Uh, Hemiok, depending when you want to do it, you can do it the early configuration of the engine and carriage sheds or later. Again, simple layout, not a lot of uh, uh, infrastructure needed to uh, do this. Uh, Hemiok is what I'm interested in. So Hemiok is the terminus of the line, therefore, you only need a connection at one end. Uh, we've got the major industry on the line was the milk plant. So traffic in and out. We have passengers, goods, and mixed trains running, uh, depending on what train was coming up from Tiverton Junction. Uh, limited infrastructure. So we've seen we have the goods shed. We have a plate layer shed. We have the, the station uh, structure. Uh, some sort of resemblance uh, to represent the milk plant would be required three ton crane and that's it. So there's not a lot there. Uh, originally it was built on woolen trade in the past. Uh, one of the earliest butter factories that was the Combe Valley uh, Dairy Company. And it was the major industry as I noted before. Uh, prototype covers an area of about 800 by 250 feet. And it's seven millimeter scales. That's about 25 by three feet. And coincidentally enough, I have space for that in my basement, which is under reconstruction after the, the fire in the house, but I have a space I can do this in seven millimeter uh, and be fairly faithful to the track layout. Uh, just put a fill yard on the up end to uh, represent the traffic to and from Tiverton Junction. Uh, it will fit into my space. I've, I've measured it up, I've looked at it. Uh, I was toying with the idea of that grain siding from Ulfcom would get bored, but uh, I probably won't do that when I get going because I think it'll be enough to keep me busy at Hemiok itself. So we'll be going to later configuration when I do it. Uh, I have plans for the goods shed, the crane, water tower, the station, Cadillac is fairly standard design, the milk factory. Uh, we, there's enough pictures of that around I can get a semblance of what that is all about. Now, here, here's an interesting thing, and this is how the internet works. Uh, way back, this would be, oh, 10 or so years ago, uh, I was on, I think, the Small Layout Design Yahoo group chat with people about uh, uh, the Cum Valley Light Railway, and somebody in Australia was suggesting this, that, and the other thing, and I was looking up some sources, and then one day I was home at lunch and taking my son back to work, and the, uh, the postman comes up, hands me a mailing tube. Okay, fine. I look at it. It's from... Uh, the UK. And I try and figure out what the hell did I order from the UK to be coming in a mailing tube? Well, when I got home, I found out that somebody on the small layout design Yahoo group worked for the County of Devon Roads Department, and he had access to the 1 to 2500 uh, ordnance survey map of Hemiak. So he sent me a copy of that plus a copy of an aerial photograph of the area. So <laughs> this, is, this is how things work. It's amazing. So Anyhow, I scanned uh, a portion of that uh, uh, OS map. Uh, they, they're fairly good on the layout of the track. Uh, you need to know how it's constructed to get it properly. But you know, we've got the track to Tiverton here, a uh, couple sidings and loops, sidings into the, uh, uh, the dairy plant. And then, then I took that into a, a program called Templot, which if anybody's interested in building uh, track work, is a good program to get. Uh, so I laid uh, that into Templot and then laid out the track work over it. So this is my working plan uh, templates for building the track work at Hemiak. Uh, just need to print them off. I can build the points and we've got we've got my layout all, all laid out there. Uh, here's an interesting picture. 
look at this quickly and it's a real airway but no this is a this is a model this is a, a seven millimeter scale model in scale seven which uh it's it's beautiful modeling this is a i've seen other pictures so it's a beautiful layout so what is uh, scale seven it's uh seven millimeter foot uh, standard survived by the scale seven group uh seven millimeter foot so it's exactly twice ho scale uh true to prototype track wheel lines the, the track age is 33 millimeters not 32 and they use finer wheel sections and the uh, flanges a similar to proto 87 p4 uh concepts the uh, p4 uh, proto 48 ys7 i was looking for a challenge uh large size uh, uh, uh 20 foot uh, wagon and old skills, same as a 40 foot HO box guard. It's getting easier on the eyes, which aren't getting any better with age. Uh, space available in my basement works well for doing Hamiak and S7. Uh, small layout, don't need a lot of uh, rolling stock, so I can get that layout equipped with rolling stock for a usual period of time. Uh, Joy scratch building, certainly get that chance in S7. So, how does a guy in Ontario? research a defunct railway on the other side of the ocean well email groups and forums of course uh books lots of books available out there uh magazines uh they were popular www uh and that's just a listing of some of the books uh, uh i've acquired over the years uh and there's others i've acquired since then plus other sources so it's uh there's quite a bit of information out there when you go looking and figure around and this is the cover of one of the books that shows the typical 14XX arriving uh, in Hemiak. He's getting ready to propel the uh, pasture coach back in so he can continue his shunting with the milk wagons. And that is the end of my uh, presentation. So you're going to scratch build everything? Uh, pretty much have to. There, uh, some of the, uh, the kits I can uh, modify uh the, the standard seven millimeter kits that just need the uh scale seven wheel sets on them which are different uh, it's almost like an rp25 profile of you think the ho rp25 it's that kind and then uh but so some of those but a lot of them i want to scratch build for uh towards the ap uh mm -hmm. get it so my my uh, rolling stock and structures there's no kits available of any of those structures so i'll have to scratch build the crane the station, uh, the good shed, there's a plate layer shed in there, the water tank. And I do have uh, drawings or uh, photos and dimensions of those. I can uh, get those uh, built uh, from scratch. So is it is it just far away from O scale that you couldn't use anything O scale? It is so, no, it is so. The only difference is that is the track gauge. Standard seven millimeter scales, a track age of 32 millimeters. Scale seven is 33 millimeter. So it's just that uh, silly millimeter wider. And then the profile of the wheels makes it look, uh, uh, you know, it's a realistic uh, uh, profile. So. so you could stretch the axles a little bit and then. You could, but uh, Slater's is a, one of the companies, Slater's Plastic, they have available wheel sets uh, for scale seven. And if you order one of their kits, you just specify the scale seven wheel set for it, and they ship it with that instead of the standard seven millimeter wheel set. Uh, locomotives, uh, the one I've got is the special set of wheels uh, turned to the profile uh, from a guy uh, in, in the UK he used to do that. So it's it's gauged out to the proper gauge, and the the flanges have been turned to the proper profile. So none, none of these steam locomotives are available commercially? Yes, they are as kits. Uh, if you wanted to just go with uh, seven, like the, the modern outline kit one is a, a beautiful etched brass kit. Uh, there are kits of the 14XX that are uh, uh, cast metal. So there are a number of uh, kits out there for that. And there are a couple of ready to run versions of the 14XX and O scale and also in uh, four millimeter scale. So uh, the steam locomotives are out there commercially available. The uh, s diesel mechanical six wheel ones out there uh, commercially, it's a very common unit, uh, both seven millimeter and four millimeter scale as are the, the class 25 type uh, locomotives. So 
all the equipment is out there, uh, depending on how you want to do it. If you want to just go uh, standard seven millimeter, everything's there. You got various number of uh, suppliers uh, in all scales to get the equipment. Uh, about the only thing you'd have to be scratch building would be uh, the stations and the uh, uh, the goods lockups and cranes and that type of thing. So what types of rolling stock or wagons are you going to run on yours? Uh, well, uh, from Monty Hammock, I'm going to probably have uh, a half dozen or more of the six wheel milk tanks because that's what uh, we need. They'll need, uh, you know, loads, uh, empties coming in and loads out. So probably need a dozen or so of those. Uh, I will, I've, I've got a couple of the Slater's kits that I'll put together with the scale seven wheels that uh, I'll use. So that's the one way and I'll probably scratch for one at a time. Uh, the others are just standard uh, open wagons, which will carry any load that could be carried in an open wagon, either tarped or untarped. So you know, it could be coal. We saw the pictures of the coal wagons at a couple of places with the coal being unloaded into sacks, lumber, whatever you could fit in. Uh, you know, typically in that big, you have uh, wagons full of uh, barrels and crates and things like that. Uh, closed vans uh, for stuff that couldn't be out in the weather. Uh, those are easy to come by uh, commercially on uh, the scales. Uh, cattle vans for the cattle docks, so that type of thing. And then the uh, the brake fan, their kits built, but I've got drawings. I'll be building one of those uh, from scratch. So did they have their own rolling stock or just use the GWR? No, it, it was, yeah, it was just, uh, it was all GWR stock uh, because it became the branch line. So Great Western operated as one of their branch lines. So locomotives were uh, Great Western. Uh, the passenger coaches were acquired from various branches on the Great Western. Uh, uh, and uh, the brake vans were various from various sources on the Great Western. Um, did the products that they hold during World War II, did, was there a change? of the kind of products that i've been trying to find out but i i don't think there'd be any big change there would be uh you know uh, there might have been an increase in some of the traffic trying to because during the war of course they were trying to increase agricultural productivity to to feed a nation uh, that was on rationing so uh mm -hmm. i i suspect uh, the types of traffic were the same the quantities were probably bigger but i'm, I'm trying to find more in that uh, time period because I'm thinking of wanting to do uh, World War II or just after World War II for modeling. Did the locomotive push the train back to Tiverton or did they have a runaround? No, there's no runaround. So it, uh, well, there was a runaround. Sorry, yeah. The locomotive stayed in the same direction. So it ran out of Tiverton Junction uh, smoke box end first and came back uh, bunker end first. Okay. So it just ran around its train at Hemiak or uh, it, uh, there was quite often a train, a couple of trains just went to Comstock or Elfcombe and they would run around there and get on the other end and run in reverse back to the junction. Uh, somewhere you mentioned flat bottom rail. Yes. That's a standard rail we see in North America, flat bottom rail. Uh, most of the rail in the UK is bullhead rail, which means it's rounded on both sides and it's held in with a special chair, which actually tilts the rail into at a about a 20 degree angle, I believe, to get uh, better mating of the rail surface with the uh, uh, the wheels. Uh, but it, this one particular spot in uh, uh, Hemiok, there was a stretch of flat bottom rail. And if you look at pictures, it stands out like a sore thumb because it's totally different. It's spiked through the timbers instead of being held on the chair. So uh, that's something to, if you're modeling Hemiok, you want to be, get the flavor. You got to get that little short stretch of flat bottom rail in there. And in the later years of the, the railroad, uh, uh, it was all relayed in flat bottom rail. So at the very end, it was all flat bottom rail. They, and that would be about 10 or 15 years before closure that they uh, pulled the rail out and replaced it. Two more questions. Yeah. Are you going to have a staging area? Yes, I w I've uh, got space. So the Hemiok will fit on one wall and can come around. Uh, the end of the basement and down the the other wall, and I'll put a fiddle yard in there. So your staging yard. It'll be uh, uh, figure out uh, whether it's going to be like uh, active staging or uh, fiddling around. We'll 
we'll get that figured out at the time. But uh, so there'll be a staging yard to represent traffic uh, or to represent Tiverton Junction and other points down the line. So trains will start there, come into Hemiac, do their work and go back. And then the last one is one of those tongue in the cheek. They claim that they've never heard you modeled with two L's. <laughs> the UK outline in scale seven. Why have we not heard about this on the AML? Uh, I have probably mentioned it somewhere along the line uh, uh, that I'm interested in British outline. And uh, the other one I'm interested in, another rabbit hole I'm going down is the War Department Light Railways from World War I, the two foot gauge, because we found out my grandfather was in the Canadian Railway Troops. So I've got the scale seven thing and then looking at the War Department Light Railways in 014, which is kind of like the exact scale for two foot gauge and seven millimeter scale. So, and there's another bunch of scratch building I'll get to do because they got all sorts of interesting uh, wagons that the War Department Light Railway used and engines. One more question snuck in. Yes. Are, are you on the scale seven members list? I am. They will I'm, track you down. They'll track you down. There's one, uh, there might be one or two others in North America, but most of them are in the, in, in the UK, but uh, it's not a huge membership. They have a decent, uh, uh, newsletter comes out, uh, again, only as good as what gets sent in mm -hmm. by the membership, but it's a good thing. And then the, they have a lot of good information on their website for helping out modeling in the uh, scale seven. Well, Bruce, that was marvelous. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. I hope uh, people enjoyed it a bit and get a better idea of what, uh, my thoughts are. And one of these days, uh, hopefully not too distant future, we'll get things going when we get back in the house in a couple months and some updates with photos on how it's growing right when we get going we'll get some updates going yes cool all right thanks, thanks guys we'll, we'll see you later Thank you.